Eden is either seen as a bastion of excellence, the guardian of standards in a world where everything else is declining and falling apart. That is one view. Another view is that it is a self-satisfied, complacent throwback to the past, which is elitist and damaging to the democratic prospects of the country. You take your choice. Eton is elitist in the sense that we believe in the pursuit of, education, of excellence in education, doing the very best. We're not interested in the second rate, whether it's academic or sports or whatever. In that sense, I am comfortable with the term elitist. But what we should not be is exclusive in the sense of shutting people out. And a lot of what we have done over the last years, recent years, is to try and make the school more accessible to a broader range of people. So I would, I'd be proud to stand up and say we're elitist in the sense we stand for excellence, but I hope we're becoming more and more accessible to a wider range of people, which would be good for all, everyone involved. Well, Eton was founded in the year 1440 by King Henry VI. King Henry was a rather a poor king in many ways but he was devoted to the idea of his religion, but also of creating an educational foundation. And he was actually 18 years old when he founded this school, and I rather liked the idea that someone so young had this idea that a place of education and worship should be woven together. Uh, he designed the school really as a, originally as a place of pilgrimage, and that has long since disappeared but the school that he created uh, lives on. The original school was designed for 70 poor scholars, uh, also with some, some priests who would be there. But what was interesting and unusual is from very early on, it was accepted that other students could come from anywhere around the country and they would pay some money towards their education. And Eaton grew very quickly from that point. It's no accident that Eaton is located where it is under the walls of Windsor Castle, because of course that is where Henry as the king would have lived. And he could look down upon this new creation, this school and this place of worship. And that uh, connection between the school and the royal family stayed strong or has stayed strong for many years. What uh, interests me about the history of Eton is that not only is it one of the oldest schools in England, one of the two or three oldest schools, but because of its location, fairly near London, it became really quite a large school early on. And most schools in England for many, many years were very small indeed. 20 or 30 students, no more. Whereas Eton had students numbering hundreds from quite early on. And certainly by the time of the 19th century was actually the largest school in England. Not just perhaps a famous school or a boarding school, but actually the largest school in England. It's not quite that now, but it is still quite a big school. And for one reason or another, it has been attractive to lots of different types of people and has managed to have an extraordinary track record of producing boys who went on to interesting careers. 18 prime ministers of this country, for example. Uh, and people of very different opinions and persuasions as well, from artists to writers. Uh, I mean, some of my favorite writers, as it happens, were educated here, like George Orwell, the, the novelist, and Percy Shelley, the poet. And they uh, tend to be of a, a political persuasion rather different from the more conservative element, which is part of the school as well. So it's been a very mixed and, and lively history, and for 565 years, Sometimes people think because Eton is it's a famous set of buildings and it's been around for a very long time that the school hasn't changed much. You know, it's locked into an image of history. It is shackled to its past in some way. But actually, no institution, no institution survives for 560 years without changing all the time. And that also is, is to me the real interest in any institution. It's how it adjusts to different ages and different times. So, in essence, Eton is a place that's been around a long time and it has a very strong sense of its history and tradition. But it only stays successful because it's under the surface, it's changing all the time.
It is like the image of the swan, you know, the traditional image of the bird gliding on the water. On the surface it looks serene and the same, but underneath the water it's paddling away, <laughs> and all the time moving and changing. And that's pretty much what life is like here. House captains, for example, who's head of house and he gets to wear a special uniform and in the last year sort of has a special waistcoat and a bow tie. And he for, apparently gets to have, gets, he's allowed to grow a beard and he's allowed to have a goat in the house master's back garden. They're asking why. Yeah, <laughs> that's the tradition apparently. In the summer we have a day called the 4th of June, which actually is a celebration for the death of King George III, who was a king in the 18th century. Well, why on earth would you celebrate this day? He was, a, he was a great supporter of Eton College. And more to the point, this king, who was, who was most famous, King George, because he was the king when we lost the American colonies. And the, his prime minister at the time, who was also responsible for losing the American colonies, was a former student from, from, from Eton. So I like to, you know, Eton has had a marked impact on the world. We, we lost the Americas and let them become what they became today. So we are, this is a, it's a day of celebration, but what is nice about the 4th of June, there are, it's a, a day when there are many concerts and events, but it is really an enormous picnic for all the families. Everybody comes down and it's usually a, a lovely summer's day. But it has some very particular Eton events. For example, on the 4th of June, we have the procession of boats. Now, Eton has a, a long tradition of rowing as a sporting activity and, and doing very well. Uh, indeed, two of our boys were half the four that won the gold medal at the Olympics last year, or well, a couple of years ago. But the procession of boats is a throwback to the 18th century. It's rowed in old-fashioned boats. The boys dress up in the costume of 1800. 1790, with straw boaters and coloured shirts and lots of flowers in their, their hats. And they row in these old boats along the Thames at the back of the college. And at the given point, they stand up in the boat. This is a, a difficult thing to do, two at a time. They stand up with their oars. You place the oar in front of you and you then stand up. And when all eight of the boys are standing up and the cocks as well, there is nothing to support the boat and it's moving slowly and it's quite a quite a feat of balance. Uh, and there are thousands of people watching this bizarre, absurd tradition. There is no point to it at all, and for that reason, I love it. There used to be such things as fagging, where old boys, where older boys would basically run the house and tell younger boys what to do. So sort of mini slavery, really. <laughs> and it got abolished, obviously. So you could tell any younger boy to do whatever you like for you, which obviously was abused and it went horribly wrong. So 18th century and 19th century public schools weren't, you know, weren't, weren't nice places. And, you know, and someone said, uh, um, you know, how was, well, what was prison like when you went there? And he said, well, I went to public school, so it, wasn't, it was okay. <laughs> Nothing compared to that. The traditions which I think are, are more serious, to me at least, are those we have, for example, in the services we run in College Chapel. Eton College Chapel was built in 1482. It's one of the very early buildings, and it's a beautiful building. It is also the one place since 1482 where every single boy who was ever a student at Eton will have been at some point. And that, I think, is a powerful image for, for me and for our current students, knowing that. When you think of for, for 500 and five and a half centuries, these young men who've gone on around the world to do all kinds of different things, they've all been in that one space, a space of gathering. Now, whether or not you are religious, and obviously it is a place of design for religious worship, but whether or not you're religious, I think you can have a profound sense of that gathering of people stretching over, over many years. And that, I think, I don't think is daunting to boys, because when you're young, who cares about that kind of thing anyway? I don't think it's daunting, but it does give a kind of confidence, a sense that what all these people have done before makes everything possible. Now, if you come from an environment where people can be 
prime minister or win an Olympic medal or win a Nobel Prize, all of which have happened. I think it gives you the aspiration to believe that you can do any of these things yourself. And in that sense, I think the traditional aspect of what we do is important. The way we run our system now is that we uh, interview and test all the students who are interested in coming at the age of 11. This is two years before you start. At Eton, you start age 13 and you go through to age 18. But we test at age 11. And it is open to anyone up to age 11 to register and apply. We don't look at anybody below the age of 10. In the old days at Eton, it used to be the system that your parents put your name down for entry to the school the moment you were born. And I am not joking, one hour old, two hours old, because it was first come, first served. So if you rang up immediately, you could secure a place. You would have to pass, the child would have to pass an exam at age 13, but the place would have been secured from almost from the moment, not quite the moment of conception, but not, not far off it, certainly the moment of birth. Uh, we have changed that system totally to make the school more open, more accessible. And so obviously you'd have pushy parents who'd push, 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 say, you know, work, 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 you've got to get in. And so that's how that worked. But now they've realised that some children who are booked in from the moment they're born, so they're born, parents write them down for Eton, some of them really aren't that clever. So parents push them, and it's a waste of their time. As a parent, you may only think about Eton College for your son when he is age nine, and that's okay. Not a problem anymore. And this has had two good advantages. First of all, within England, it has made the prospect of an education at Eton open to more families. More people think about it. And is it also true of families abroad? You know, we have some Russian students here, and I don't think many Russian families would have thought of uh, putting their son down for Eton when the son was one hour old. <laughs> so, so the system has advantages in making it more uh, a broader base, a broader mix of students, which is something we want. So at 10 and 6 we test them and it involves verbal reasoning, non-verbal reasoning, mathematics, English and quickness of the mind. Basically we're checking their capabilities, not the knowledge, but their ability to think on their feet. So if they do the test well, then they, uh, they're interviewed for 15 minutes on what you've just asked, an extra curriculum. Tennis, football, music, singing, whatever they like doing. And the social skills are tested as well. Do they look into your eyes? Are they polite? You know, do they sit straight? Do they poke their nose or not? So all that is accumulated into a report. The test results are added to that. Then we require the headmaster of their previous school to write a special reference. And all of these three documents come to us and monitor their progress from then onward. At the age of 13, they see the common entrance exams. It's all the same exams for any public school, private school. And if they pass them as well, only then they come to Eton and then they accept it into Eton. So all kids get a conditional place which means only if they pass all this testing, they will be accepted. The ones you've seen in the street who wear special gowns, you know, they look like penguins or magicians, they, on top of everything I've just told you, they sit another seven tests of much harder nature, devised from very basic to PhD standard in all these subjects, history, English, mathematics, all three sciences. And if they do well there, then they accept it into King's Scholar position, which is the most prestigious position to be in. Their education is paid for and big companies start targeting them very early, from the age of 13. But we have, I suppose, something of the order of about a thousand, uh, a thousand boys, a thousand students who will go through the application process and we're looking in any given year for about 250. Uh, but it's, I always maintain, as with, en with entry to any competitive place, that uh, someone has to be offered a place, so why shouldn't it be you? When you first join Eton, you're always given a dictionary, a small book, 
with the vocabulary you have to learn as a teacher as well as as a student that we use here that is not commonly used by people outside Eton and it's not a kind of uh, language to prevent other people to understand what's going on it's just the traditional usage of old words that are not used in modern English anymore simple example word lesson in Eton is not in usage at all you would never hear anybody using word lesson which is you would expect you know in school to be used quite often simply because the only classroom of Eton was subdivided into two by a special division which is a wooden block it's like a fence and when the masters changed from Latin to Greek class and they changed, shouted something like change division and they changed from one class side of the class to the other and this wall is still used as a word for lesson so in our language division is a synonym for modern word for lesson so crazy <laughs> we're different languages not english <laughs> sort of beak is a teacher uh, i don't really know why <laughs> it's sort of tradition i think and also we have sort of you know break it's not called break it's called chambers and it's called chambers i think because all the all the beaks go into the main school hall, we go back to our houses and have you know, cakes and things and relax for like 10 minutes or something. And they go to Chambers, which is a big meeting for Beaks every morning. And then we then meet them outside Chambers to talk about, you know, anything. Sort of, sorry sir, I've got a music lesson in, a, in your div, so I can't make your lesson. Or, so I haven't done your, your EW, which is homework, so please can I be excused? Or, sir, I've got this and this commitment, you know, would you like to come? And it's sort of a meeting place between Beaks and pupils. So although you understand all these words, and it is quite a lot of them, you're actually quite lost. And the funny thing is, if you're a young teacher and you don't know all these words, boys very quickly suss you out that you're a freshman, which is, can be quite embarrassing. So it's very important you do your homework before you, you, you start teaching. Sometimes people say if we wished to somehow leap into the modern age and show the world what a, a new, lively place we are, then we just wear ordinary clothes. So why keep this strange dress? And it's a funny thing to wear. Well, actually, if you ask the students themselves, in a very large majority, they would wish to keep the uniform. If you have to wear any uniform, then they would rather have this one than anything else. And it's interesting why that's the case, partly because there is a sense of tradition about it. Actually, it's pretty practical also. To, uh, it's, it's quite hard wearing and tough, so it's a, an easy thing to wear. But also, it is very good, you know, at making people anonymous in the street. Because once you wear a uniform like this, everyone looks the same. And it's a very good defense against tourists. Good story, nice story. I was told this by a boy who left here two years ago. He was cornered in the street wearing his school uniform by tourists really wanting to take a photograph of one of the royal princes when the princes were at Eton. But he had to do. And so he dutifully allowed himself to be photographed. And as they were taking the photograph, one of the royal princes with some friends walked right past them wearing school dress and they didn't notice. And it, it's quite convenient that it enables everyone to feel part of this community and to be a little protected perhaps from some of the intrusions of the outside world. This is my standard Eton uniform. I'm an infantry man, as if you'd like to put it that way, sort of bog standard, sort of tail coat, waistcoat, trousers, shoes, and this is just a normal tie, which is sort of, you undo it like that, and then you, you, have, a, you have a collar stud there. Collar stud there and you do it, so it's a detachable collar oh. and then you just do it up like that and then you have this thing which is sort of a white sort of, I don't know, vicar-like tie so it's called an Eton tie and then you sort of do it up and uh, fold it back in but once you get more up in the school you go into your last year and then you start getting prefects and uh, then get, they get to wear bow ties Boys have a Eton suit, as it's called, yeah, which looks like an evening suit for gentlemen. Uh, for teachers, it's a bit easier because we have only requirement for Eton masters is uh, wins the collar that you can see here, 
which is Stockholm, and the bow tie, which is a symbol of, uh, of a teacher, so only teachers are allowed to wear it. Suit can be of any type or sort, it has to be a dark one, but that's the only requirement. It's very smart and it creates a particular formal atmosphere in a classroom, which shows uh, dual respect, so they respect us, we respect them as well, and that creates an eaten atmosphere of academic learning. When I started here as a boy, for example, it was still the case there was physical beating. You know, if, if you were in trouble, you did something wrong, then you would be hit for it. You were beaten with a big stick. Still happened. Really? Yeah. Not often, uh, but it happened, it happened to me on one or two occasions for doing things wrong. And uh, th I mean, th this is long, 20 years ago, 30 years ago that went. And the notion of doing that now is n not even in the mind. And it is, it's just a totally different way of thinking about life. They're normal boys. They sometimes misbehave. It's quite a rare occasion, nothing serious. But we do have a system which works effectively and has been proven over the centuries. Things like being late to lessons, being late with your homework, uh, being impolite to adults, being absent-minded, uh, violating the school tidy routine, they're all different things. I mean, so if you do a bad piece of work, you get a rip, which is symbolic of a bad piece of work. So your, your, your teacher will rip the top, and that's called a rip. So you have to take that to your housemaster and get it signed. A bit less than a rip is a get signed for information, which says, this wasn't too good, take it to your housemaster, to, so you can have a look, you know, you didn't do too well. Rip is a bit worse. Then you've got tardy book, which is not academic misbehavior, it's more general misbehavior. So, I don't know, being late for a div, a division, again, that's a lesson. Uh, being late for a div, you can get tardy book for that, and you can get three days tardy book, which is getting up early in the morning to sign a book really early, and then you're half asleep, so it's, <laughs> you're, most people don't like it. And when somebody comes late with his homework to me, I say it's irritating because I like to mark them all in the same time. So if you're late and somebody else is late, it messes up my routine. So we mess up their routine, so they have to get up early. And it usually works wonders. Very quickly, they get into line very quickly. That's kind of minor things. Then after that, I suppose you've got the bill. And the bill is a sort of form of detention where you see the headmaster, he decides what punishment to give you. So it could be detention for two hours, it could be chores somewhere, which is, you know, tidy up one of the classrooms for two hours, or, or anything like that. It could even be sort of... Uh, maybe going to the fields and clearing that up. So that's the bill. And then there's, uh, there's close gating, which is a form of internal punishment. So let's say you've been drinking on Saturday evening and you come back completely drunk. You then have to stay in the school and wear school uniform for three days completely without changing. And you have to sign into school office every hour so they can check where you are. So that's a bit annoying, sort of big brother is watching you sort of thing. And, uh, and then the biggest is expulsion. You get expelled. A good school is good for many reasons. And whether it is single sex or co-education, that's not one of them. <laughs> but one of the things I do notice in a single sex school, in a boys school, is that the quality of standards in everything that is done here is exceptionally high. Not just in academic work and sports, but also in art and in music. And I think there is an argument that when boys, teenage boys are able to focus on what they do within the community of the school without distraction, they willingly give more than they would otherwise do. And people, it's a very busy place this. People work extremely hard in all kinds of areas. Uh, but uh, to give an example also that at my last school, in subjects like English literature, most of the students, when they became age 17, 18, and you could choose subjects, most of the students would be girls. And in physics, the students would be boys. It developed a certain kind of uh, pattern according to gender. Whereas here, the study of English literature is a normal thing. Boys do it, it's, it's not an issue. So it's. There are some advantages. There are disadvantages too, one can argue. 
both systems work very well. But I think there is a place for single sex education. It is a minority now in England. The, the vast majority of schools in the state sector and in the private sector are co-educational. So it is only a smallish number now uh, that remain uh, single sex. Surprisingly, if you say to most people, would you like to go co-ed? They'd say no, I think, because they've got so used to being an all-boys school and then on the weekend you relax and you go and see the girls and, and it's just the way you're you know, perceived. Actually, no distractions in lessons. No, don't go, whoop. <laughs> so no distractions and uh, just, you know, you just concentrate on what you've got to do. And it's just, I think, most people accept the tradition, I think. And it doesn't bother most people, I think. Every boy has a mobile phone, every boy has a laptop. You're in contact with your friends and your family all the time. It's a totally different feeling to the idea of boarding, whether this is at Eton or in any boarding school. I sometimes say I am of the generation when you were taken to school at the beginning of the term, and if you were lucky, your parents picked you up at the end of it. It's quite, it's quite a busy day today. Uh, wake up, I meant to wake up at 7.30. Woke up at eight, it's bad. <laughs> Went to breakfast. Um, after breakfast, uh, go back to the house, get my books ready, then we have to go to chapel. Uh, although we had assembly today, actually, so it varies. Went to assembly, had a speech about uh, Nelson, because it's coming, the birthday, anniversary of Trafalgar, the Battle of Trafalgar's coming out. So I talked about that. Well, he talked to us about that, we just sit there listening, half asleep. Uh, then we had three lessons or divs, we call them divs. Then you have chambers, which is break time. Chambers is about 20 minutes. Then you have another couple of divs. Then lunch. After lunch, you usually have sport. A lot of the people do sport, or depending on what your extracurricular things are. I personally was doing social services this afternoon, which is, you know, helping the community, which in C Block you have to do, because you either have to join the core, which is sort of join the sort of little military, Eton military core for a year where you sort of do soldier stuff, would be. <laughs> or you do social services where you help the community and help old grannies and things like that. So I do that on Mondays, did that for a few hours. Uh, then came back, had another couple of divs. Then here, interviewing with you. And then I've got orchestra tonight after supper, which goes on till about 10. And then I have to do my work. <laughs> So, Working at Eton is more of a lifestyle uh, than just a job and very often you can easily work 12 hours per day and you work six days a week including Saturdays and if you're lucky you get a Sunday off where you can have just a bit of a rest and prepare yourself for the next week. Well, there's a school, a school pub called TAP. Outside Eton it wouldn't be legal because it's for 16, 17, 18 year olds. It's just, it's sort of special rules and it applies to eat and then you can have, you know, a couple of pints and a meal. Now they've brought in a new law, which means that they've gone all, they've gone all high tech and apparently we can only have two pints maximum with a meal, because it's, the government's being all tight about alcohol and we have to put our fingerprints in and so they monitor how many taps, how many like pints we've had. So we can't just say, oh, I'm getting one for a friend or, you know, don't ask me. <laughs>
and ask them what they remember about their time at Eton. You know, was it the privilege or the uniform or the, uh, the, the, the sports they played or the fact they did very well and got to a good university? Sure, yeah, they get, but it tends not to be that. Very often it is the memory of one particular teacher with a burning enthusiasm for some subject. I spoke recently with one Eton boy who's now 35 years old and is successful in the city of London. He's a very good career. And he says the single thing he valued most at Eton was learning about Italian Baroque architecture. And it wasn't the subject so much as the passion of the teacher which inspired him. And that's, in many ways, I think a very good story because it illustrates what one hopes is true of a good education. It is, it's the spark that ignites a passion or a, or a yearning, a, a longing for more knowledge, for a greater understanding. And if you do that just once with a young person, then that actually translates to the rest of, of life. You can reproduce that in many different ways. We are fortunate in having former students here who clearly have an affection for the school and the reason the school has been able to thrive and grow in the way it has over many, many years is because of the gifts we have received and some of them quite remarkable gifts over the years. Whether, for example, it's rather like Henry Wotton in the 1720s who donated his spectacular collection of books which is the basis of College Library. And College Library is one of the jewels at Eton, for me. I, I think it is a wonderful place of interesting and rare books. For example, uh, one of the best quality editions in the world of the Gutenberg Bible, you know, the very first printed text. Uh, manuscripts by famous authors, uh, first editions, whether it's uh, James Bond novels, because Ian Fleming was a former student here, he wrote those books through to manuscripts of uh, poets like Shelley or Thomas Hardy novels. It's a treasure trove, an absolutely wonderful collection which people have given gifts to. And that is a, a wonderful experience for young students, simply to be able to be close to that kind of material. It's a, an inspiration. So whether it's gifts like that or whether it is actually financial bequests over the year which have helped fund scholarship or build buildings. So, the Eaton family, in that broad sense, the Eaton family that goes on, even if you're 70 years old or 80 years old, you're, you're still a, a, an Eaton boy, has been very important to us. And certainly something from my point of view, I'm keen to encourage because it is very much for the good of the school. Oh, yeah, plays. I mean, Eaton has a great theatre over there, which is it's, it's huge. And it's, it's, it's a professional theatre, I mean, with all, the, with all the sort of equipment and all the... Uh, capabilities of a proper theatre and so you go there and do really great plays because I mean the acting talent is is huge at Eton. I mean, so many people to choose from and surprisingly we've got so much talent and there's we school put on King Lear the other day one of Shakespeare's big hard tough tragedies heavy stuff and it was amazing it was incredible I wasn't in there I was watching because we're doing a house play so with the house but I watched it it was incredible it's so good what people who visit the school are surprised by because the answer to that is that the comment I regularly get from parents particularly who visit for the first time is they're amazed that we don't have a great big security wall around the place. It's public streets, it's open. It, and it, that's a very good example of how Eton is different on the inside from the way sometimes it might appear on the outside. Uh, but I think it is very important uh, for Eton, it always has been, that boys in an all-boys boarding school live and work as part of a town with public roads, open streets, anyone can wander through. It's, life goes on all around them, unlike some educational institutions which are along a great driveway somewhere out in the country, removed from everywhere. So Eton isn't the cut-off, removed, isolated institution that sometimes people might believe, which is rather more the stuff of legend, I think, than reality. Boys can be absolutely anything. And the, thing, the great thing about Eton is that there's the academic side of it, but at the same time it promotes whatever your interests are. And it just you know, encourages individuality. And just, you know, if you like to do something, you know, do it and pursue it to the greatest you know, potential.
I think the history of, of Russian, as I see it, the learning of Russian in England is very interesting. When I was a student in the 1960s and, and 70s, in the days of the mysterious Soviet Union, which was a thing of darkness and mystery, learning Russian was sexy. It was a cool thing to do. It was almost the, it was the stuff of MI5 and James Bond and the KGB. And it, was, it was actually quite a, it was also difficult, so it was an intellectual challenge. So it, it wasn't widespread, but there were some interested and interesting boys who would learn Russian. With the fall of the Berlin Wall, interest in learning Russian declined dramatically. But it is subsequently at Eton picked up again and is now strong. And I think that's for two reasons. First, because it is well taught and it's interesting. The second, because I think Etonians now see opportunities in the modern Russia, which they wouldn't have thought of 10 or 20 years ago. It is sometimes said, I don't know whether this is true, but it is sometimes said that over the centuries, Eton boys have shown a remarkable knack of spotting where the power is, where things change, whether it's in politics or in business or in what part of the world. So it's quite an interesting barometer of reaction that we've had this early interest which falls away and now comes back. And there are, we've had more students studying Russian at the senior level, age 17, 18, this year than, for example, studied German. Now, that is a dramatic change from 20 years ago. But I also have to say there are more people now learning Mandarin than are learning Russian. <laughs> it's moving all the time. In Britain, you're absolutely right. The numbers of students doing Russian is declining, and the majority of reasons I can give you will be economical ones. Uh, schools who cannot recruit more than 10 students to do it, uh, the course is considered not you know, viable to run, and that's why a lot of schools drop it, just for the pure economics. Eton luckily doesn't have the problem with financing, so we managed to sustain numbers and over the last seven years the actual number of students have, has been growing. We're very happy. In 98, when, we, when I came to Eton, we had three students doing Russian. Today we have 57, which is a very healthy, healthy, you know, number for us. So I had some sort of Russian sort of history to me, because my dad was a diplomat. And he used to, so we used to live there for sort of six, seven years, well, I did. And then I came to England. And I was just generally sort of brought up there. And I find it really interesting, the whole culture, the, I mean, the literature, the people. I find it fascinating. I think I'll probably, probably do it at university as well. Recent stability in Russian politics has been good for us. Uh, tradition of intellectual curiosity at Eton College is a very strong point. So a lot of boys who consider some languages very easy would find Russian challenging and interesting and will come to us. Also, you know, as far as we are concerned, we do everything to, for the students to make them interested. We take them to a Russian theatre, Russian rock concerts. We take them to Russia every year. We organise pancakes, parties. We drink tea in Russian style. We have quiz nights. We have joint meetings with girls from schools who also study Russian. And virtually it becomes like a lifestyle. And the kids, you know, respond positively to all these things that we provide for them. Yeah, a lot. Our year is, I mean, we have 30 students doing Russian out of 250, which is it's huge for a, for a single language. I mean, French obviously has m about 70, Spanish has about 40. But so, you know, Russian's not far behind and it's catching on. It's really good. And especially with, I mean, Russia's developing so quickly and so many things are happening. Films are coming out, music's coming out. It's really exciting. Really, really exciting. Oh, we get all kinds of stuff from Mr. Reznikov. Chicherina, <laughs> then Joker ones like Glucosa, <laughs> what else, uh, classics like Angelica Varum, <laughs> what else? Uh, Is it supposed to be classics? Uh, classics, old stuff. <laughs> what else? Uh, 50s music, so a lot of stuff. Bidva, Splin, yeah. Umitroy. <laughs> you, you might be interested to know that there's a uh, 
Etonian society in Moscow, all the boys who studied Russian and go to work in Russia, they actually keep in touch and they organize sometimes meetings. A good one, a good example would be they chipped in and bought me a ticket to say thank you. So they flew me to Moscow, gave me a nice dinner in a nice restaurant and paid for the mail and for my flight there and back just to say thank you very much for teaching us Russian. So they do find the jobs Main areas of usage of Russian nowadays would be foreign office, uh, business, some go to secret services, you know, MI5, MI6. But I'm hoping that they will be looking at Russia in a very positive way because we, <laughs> we do try to encourage them to, to understand Russia better than their parents and grandparents used to. We try to market Russian as a quite challenging but very rewarding experience. So the boys work hard, but they, you know, they play hard and they, you know, have a good time at this, you know, at the same time. And they find it's quite exotic because obviously of the Cyrillic alphabet. But once they see it through, it's quite easy and straightforward. They actually enjoy it. And because it's so different and no other schoolmates can read it, unlike German or Spanish or Italian, where they use the Latin script, they find quite privileged and, you know, excited that they can read a language that nobody else can read, as well as all our distinctive cultural differences. I am the first boy, I'm the first male in my family to be educated over the age of 14, let alone go to a school like Eton or go to university. Uh, and I came here on a scholarship and Eton paid all my fees because my family didn't have the money. And that's one of the reasons, in the end, I chose to come back here as headmaster, is that I feel a commitment to this place because it gave me something. It actually changed my life and the expectations and the opportunities that were open to me. And I certainly want to do my bit to help make this school as good as it can be, but also underline my own personal commitment to broadening the access to this school as much as we can plausibly make it. Well, it used to be the case that, you know, if you go to Eton, you're sort of guaranteed Oxbridge, Oxford and Cambridge, and then you're guaranteed a great job. It's, I know it's not the case anymore. So, you know, you have to work hard and, uh, you know, you're privileged enough to come here. And then you're not necessarily guaranteed Oxford or Cambridge. You know, you have to work, and especially now, people say that you know, they don't favor non-public school boys because there's a whole rant about them saying you know we can't be seen to only be accepting people from public school but it's, it's public schools are funny to have because you think public as in state but in england public school means the private schools so they can only be seen to you know take public school boys so there was this whole thing about how they're even good public school boys are being pushed aside to leave room for you know normal state education people who are clever and occasionally they were roused because people from public school were blatantly cleverer than these people from state school. And obviously, you know, it's fair, you shouldn't discriminate state people from public school people, but you know, you should get a right balance. So anyway, it's still hard to get into university now, especially with all that controversy. But yeah, you have got an advantage, but the advantage I think is not being an Etonian. I think the advantage is coming to a school which has so much to offer and so many facilities, which then allows you to be what you turn out to be. So if the theatre capabilities, you know, a guy who left a few years ago called Eddie Redmayne, he's just started, he's about 22, he's already making a film with Angelina Jolie and uh, Robert De Niro directing it, and it's coming out in a sort of couple of years. So it's the facilities which they give you, it's not, I'm an Etonian, give me a job. It's, I went to Eton, so I was able to do all this, and here I am, and I can do this. So they see what you can do, and they think, wow, that's amazing. And then they find out that maybe, maybe you're an Etonian. If, if a boy aged 18 is not able to deal with the range of things that the world will throw at him, then he has not made them, uh, taken advantage of his education and we haven't taught him very well. Sometimes the, the world outside has an image that an Etonian will behave in a certain way, will be arrogant or stuck up or um, full of himself or will be disinterested in other people. And I say to all our 18-year-olds, just as they leave, if any of you ever behave in that way, you deserve everything you get. You deserve all the opprobrium, <laughs> all the critical comment that you will receive, and I will have no time for you. But if you just show yourself to be 
the decent human being, the person concerned for society, the good citizen that the vast majority of them are, then not only will you be of use to people, but you'll be celebrated as well. And I think that the, having the badge of being an Etonian raises the stakes a little. People expect more of you and they expect different things from you. You've got to be careful not to be arrogant about it, definitely. You know, a lot of people may come out of Eton being arrogant. And they, they definitely did, I think, before. But now I think it's changed with the sort of modern perception of things and just general valuing of hard work, I think. It's so much more... In the old days, it used to be so sort of social class and you're standing in society, whereas now it's like hard work and your own effort is valued much more, which sort of pushes arrogance to the side because you just get on with things.